I know, here he is. Am I on now? Good. Before I start today, um, I want to uh, thank Duncan, thank Robert, who's our production manager back there for the video side, and thank Ben Cameron, because um, they've made uh, today's meeting, uh, joining uh, of the minds as it were possible for Bruce and myself and for you. Um, it is very difficult, as you may appreciate, uh, in these times for us to pull the resources together to do this for you. We would do more if we could, but uh, unfortunately, uh, our businesses uh, take our time, too. Um, I need to uh, uh, put a special welcome to a couple of folks here. I'll tell you a story about two of them in a second. Uh, to Ruth, you're out there. Hello, Ruth. Hello, Lynn. Um, I was trying to get a taxi out of the the uh, hotel where I was staying this morning, and I was a bit late getting here. And um, so I was racing to the desk to get a taxi and put my bags down the lobby, and two ladies uh, sitting there um, were standing in need of a seat, so I said, sit down, I'm just getting a taxi. They said, so are we, we're going where you're going. I said, oh, oh yes, and they, we're going to your lecture. Oh, that's good, well, we'll share a taxi. Mistake number one. <laughs> fairly, fairly attractive buddies they were, too. I'm, I'm glad I. But my wife wasn't here, I'd really been in trouble. I said, fine, let's go. So we got in the taxi and we had the driver and, and we all pulled out the little car to where we're going, over here somewhere in Chatswood. And we told him. And we were driving and chatting away about life, death, the universe and everything. And I noticed that we were coming into a residential area and more residential area. And then he stops, says, here we are at uh, number seven. I said, this is a house, this isn't a community center. It's Victoria Avenue. Oh. And we look through, and he says, no Victoria Street in the, in the thing at all. So we're all sitting there puzzling, and we drive over to uh, Roseville, and uh, we take a very circuitous route. We stop a German couple in the street and say, excuse me, we're lost. And uh, they looked through their directory, and it wasn't there either, and somebody thought to look at the ticket, and it said Victor Street. <laughs> so we finally got here out the front, only a little bit late. I understand now, one of the girls is Irish. <laughs> Sorry, this is going to Ireland. That was just a joke. Just a joke. <laughs> That's uh, Therese and Jill. Hi, guys. I think you're back there somewhere, aren't you? Yes. Yes, there you are. Now, we're transmitting uh, today's uh, session and tomorrow uh, through our network. Um, we'll transmit it later after we compile the things into it uh, to 22 countries around the world. Uh, we have a rather loose network of research fellows like yourself uh, with varying degrees and talents and positions in government. And uh, I would like to, uh, I'll just say a couple of words to them because uh, by country, we've got the United States, uh, we've got several groups online there in Tucson and in um, California and Texas. And so to the United States, where are you on that camera? Hi, you guys. And if Willard Scott's still there, hi. Do any of you watch the, uh, the American news? Willard Scott's an institution there. In Canada, we've got Canada, South Africa, Finland online, and Ireland. Remember that, guys. Uh, Japan, uh, we'll be uh, joining with Japan uh, in about the next two months. Ohio Gazaimas. And Germany, Guten Acht, me tag. It's afternoon here, guys. And Yugoslavia, Dobrodan, Spain, Peru, Costa Rica, Buenos Aires, mis amigos también. And finally, to uh, Israel, to the uh, community there, Bokratov and Barakata. Now, I'm down to business. All the howdies and aunts and uncles and greetings. Say again. Holland? Not that I know of. We'll work on it. Hello, Holland, if we get you there. Do they speak English in Holland? <laughs> okay, now Bruce mentioned a few things in his lecture uh, that I told him last night. We were discussing what he was going to talk about, and there are a couple of things that I could uh, share with him uh, uh, and you as far as video information on the um, uh, verification of some of his um, mathematics or you know the postulations he's making um, the Martian face uh, thing has puzzled me for some time trying to figure out whether it was somebody trying to stretch too much out of, a, of an image that may be a natural formation so I have some friends um, in Houston uh, part of uh, the MUFON network and uh, uh, visit uh, John Schusler and uh, uh, Ron Madeley and uh, James Francis and they do an awful lot of research in fact uh, we have over there, as I understand, a room about a third or fourth the size of this room stacked to the ceiling with uh, documents, uh, videos, tapes, testimonies. Uh, and one of these chaps works in the space uh, uh, field for, um, he's a subcontractor to NASA. 
and uh, so we have a, a lot of access to things which I'll show you today, including some uh, footage from a STS-48 shuttle mission where they actually filmed the UFO from orbit. Quite an impressive one. And we've got five scenes. Uh, the fifth one isn't here yet because we're re-editing that in the States. It's really impressive. Now, Richard Hoagland uh, is the chap who's been doing the majority of the work of developing the uh, face on Mars uh, hypothesis and the fact that it might be a way of communicating um, a mathematical uh, theorem to people who would visit the planet later after the civilization left. I still remain open, I must tell you at the beginning, as to whether or not it is a real face and a real pyramid, but I, I think you'll see the same evidence I've seen. And coupled with some of the things that Bruce has said about the, the uh, tetrahedral points, you know, and the sphere around this, coupled with that, I think that Hoagland is on a, a winner, and we're going to eventually have a new, simpler kind of mathematics for at least celestial uh, mechanics. We certainly need one. Uh, there was an astronomer down here. Um, this would help us to solve the, uh, the uh, multiple body uh, mutual perturbations uh, equation, which is very difficult, as you would appreciate. I'm sure that the ancients had it. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't know how they would have done it without computers. OK, um, I've got tape in here. We'll just um, cue it, hopefully, down to the spot where we're going to look at a three-dimensional head uh, generated by a Cray computer, plus some terrain on the Martian area called um, Sedona. What you're seeing here is a digitized map of Los Angeles area and the hills and the uh, Pacific Ocean down uh, at the lower end of the screen. Uh, using the same technique we're using here, they're, they're going to show you how they created the imagery on Mars, but they wanted to show you using this technique from aerial uh, photogrammetric uh, information how Los Angeles looks, and then we'll take the same technique to the Martian data. This is Los Angeles, California on July 3rd, 1985. We are now traveling toward the Pacific Ocean at about 200,000 miles an hour and will drop down behind Santa Catalina Island about 26 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. We're going to fly through the isthmus of the island and then cross the coast north of the Santa Monica Mountains. As we head south, we can see features such as Marina del Rey and Los Angeles International Airport. We see the Palos Verdes Peninsula in the center now, along with the Long Beach Harbor. Now, we're moving down into the Orange County area. The bow tie shaped feature now visible are Balboa and Lido Islands in Newport Bay. We're heading toward Los Angeles, and in the center of the screen is downtown. We can see Mount Baldy at the top right of the screen, and as we pan the San Gabriel Mountains, we can note in the foreground the Santa Fe Dam and Recreation Area, the Santa Anita Racetrack and Golf Course. Now, picture yourself flying only a few thousand feet above the Martian surface at Sidonia, courtesy of the most accurate photo representation of another planet currently available. another segment where they get a little bit closer and enhance with other uh, uh, frames from the same mission from a different angle to get to the um, to the head uh, in the dark side of it and uh, get more detail of that image to see if it is like a head. This is raw data from Viking, low sun angle, 10 degree sun. This photo, high sun angle, 30 degree sun. This photo and the matching computer reconstruct uh, lit in the computer at the same lighting based on the three dimensional reconstruction of the underlying topography. And what's interesting to note is that even subtle features, uh, although the resolution is degraded because of the transform steps somewhat, even subtle features of the original data are reproduced in the reconstruction, giving one confidence that in fact we do have a handle now on the three-dimensional underlying topography. 
Uh, Mark also was able to project the low sun angle frame onto its wire form diagram and then rotate in the computer the result so that we can, in essence, fly around in a helicopter, although you can't have a helicopter on Mars, um, this object at a reasonable altitude to try to gain a view in terms of its perspective uh, from, from multiple uh, azimuth directions. And it, uh, it, it demonstrates one important thing, and that is that not only is the object bilaterally symmetric in two dimensions, but also in three. Look at the so-called chin. Look at where it peaks and where the flat part of the, the headdress or whatever it is and the eyebrow ridge peak right down the axis symmetry. So we're dealing with a symmetry not just in two dimensions, but in three. Now these are all analysis that were brought to this data not inside the planetary science community, but outside. All right, now we'll look very closely at one of the five-sided pyramids there in this um, segment that they took on the Viking probe. This object has very interesting multiple levels, and it looks slightly familiar. It turns out that it is a very good analog to objects that we have seen in ancient Britain. One in particular, Silbury Hill. Another one, the Old Sarum Earthworks. The proportions and the scale, this thing is about two miles across, all right, but um, the one uh, uh, in Britain is uh, the largest man-made earth-filled structure anywhere in the uh, world. Moving on. This is the um, enhancement of the, of the object. There's two little mounds to the north of it that are separated from the top object uh, that we've discerned now on the apex by 60-60, uh, 60, 60, 60 degree angles. This was the, uh, the um, pyramid discovered by Di Pietro Molinar, and it is uh, really important in that as you begin to look at various contrast enhancements, you discover that, in fact, it is a five-sided object on a planet where five-sided objects uh, cannot form. Not only is this structure five-sided, but the geomorphologically, as you go up through the various possible formation mechanisms, things like mass wasting and uh, wind faceting and uh, sedimentation and all that, he has been able to systematically eliminate every plausible natural mechanism to create a bilaterally symmetric five-sided object of the proportions and height of this object. There is nothing like this anywhere, not only on Mars, but also on Earth. All right, we'll take one last uh, rip across the planet in another area with a little more detail and color, and then we'll get on to um, toroidal or asymmetric propulsion in the real world here. For many years, the, the unusual dimensions of Mars, particularly this object and these three volcanoes, has puzzled the geographers and the planetologist types because it is orthographically unsupported. In other words, this thing bulges out and is not hydrostatically sitting on anything down below. It has deformed the overall figure of Mars to a significant extent. And there have been many, many models to try to explain how that, in fact, can happen. Um, we now think we can explain the Tharsis bulge. We think that as a, as a side effect of decoding the mathematics of Sidonia, we now understand why Mars is lopsided, why it is not or was not in hydrostatic equilibrium. In fact, why this whole hemisphere bulges out somewhat over a perfect spherical figure. In other words, we think we have discovered an insight as a side effect to our efforts to verify the reality of Sidonia because the mathematics are telling us something profound and important we now believe about the way planets work. This is the kind, by the way, of three-dimensional um, uh, imagery and computer reconstruction that we are hoping to be able to apply to the Sidonia data. It looks neat, and it would be very helpful in determining the fine points of some of the geometry. <clears throat> but John, we don't have the money, but we need a cray, and we understand you have one, and I think you get the point that these are extraordinary objects that all sit in a place where they shouldn't, and uh, we now think that maybe we know why. We looked at the outer solar system and realized very quickly that the great red spot is located at 19.5 south. 
and it is rotating in this direction, counterclockwise. Well, this gave us a clue to the physics that might lie behind this so far geodetic and, and uh, mathematical pattern. Because it has been called a storm, it has been called a hurricane, but in fact, it is probably a deep-seated vortex extending deep into Jovian mantle of liquid hydrogen and helium. These are two color views taken during the Voyager missions. This is sort of natural color. This is exaggerated color. This thing rotates once around every 12 days. I mean, the, the scale of the physics that you're looking at with this vortex, and it is a vortex, are enormous. But there is a clue because in the pursuit of vorticular fluid dynamics, one of the starting points and mathematical descriptions of that kind of fluid flow is tetrahedral mathematics. Now this is where uh, I, I think in this section here they draw some lines and circles at 19 and a half degrees is which, where I think we kind of what Bruce is talking about. If you place a hypothetical tetrahedron in the Martian sphere in the planet Mars, one point one corner will lie exactly underneath the major volcano Olympus Mons on Mars, as I described at the Lewis presentation. This major Mars energy feature lies at 19.5 degrees north latitude. The next point of the hypothetical tetrahedron on Mars lies 120 degrees east on the exact Martian longitude of Sidonia itself. Thus, Sidonia's very placement on the planet had to be intentional. One of our colleagues, David Myers in California, raised the possibility some months ago that a specific surface distance at Sidonia might measure exactly 1 360th the diameter of Mars. When Errol Torin, my colleague at Defense Mapping, and I checked Myers' suggestion, lo and behold, Myers was exactly right. The face DNM pyramid distance measures precisely 1 360th of the planetary diameter and a second parallel measurement between the city square and the teardrop on the face and between the DNM wedge and the same teardrop also measures exactly 19 and a half minutes of arc on the Martian planetary surface. And a minute of arc is 1 60th of a degree which only exists in our 360 degree system of angular measurements. Uh, Bruce was talking um, about um, the um, UFOs he'd seen. I'm sure you've seen some of them too, where you have um, a dead pin. That was good. That was a blink out, wasn't it? Let's try this one here. Whiteboard marker, that one. Huh? Where you have your uh, pattern of UFOs that seem to, to travel in little groups of triangles or maybe like this. And I hadn't quite figured this out in, in, in our mathematics when Bruce was talking about it. He wasn't even addressing the problem. I was sitting there at the back, and it suddenly dawned on me. We've been generating something we haven't written about uh, to you people, um, a new model for uh, nuclear physics uh, as a, an inertial model rather than plus and minus charges and little rays and stuck into a nucleus. And we've been trying to solve how electrons uh, jump orbit or quantum levels in discrete increments, why it occurred. Same thing applies to these flying saucers. Just looking down on the top of them, don't ask quite a moment, but assume that there is a field around these craft, part of their propulsion, that spins in that direction. In, a, um, in this case, a counterclockwise direction in each of them. Counterclockwise, what is that? That would be there and there. Am I coming through? Yes, okay. Now, a byproduct of two types of propulsion that I'm aware of, uh, Earth-made research uh, propulsion of aircraft, generates motion in uh, ionized air or in a magnetic field outside the craft and it influences the media out beyond the edge of the craft, sometimes uh, uh, 400 feet in radius. That means that air or other media that it's affecting will share the inertia and create a counter spin to balance it out here. It's conservation of momentum. So outside of this, out here is another inertial ring going opposite. If you put your hand through water, you'll notice the curls go back in the direction you just came from, okay? That's conservation of momentum. Same thing here. Now watch what happens if we do that with two of these and let them share that space. Being a curl coming back this way. Uh, let's see, how do we do that? We go, um, uh, we go like this. 
got a curl going this way, all right? Now, this one peels off and anti-curls this way. This one peels off and anti-curls that way, and they form between them a vortex of space that conserves the momentum between them and holds them together. Why? Because as this uh, media is moving fast, it's like air going over a wing, it lowers the pressure at right angles, Bernoulli's lift theorem. Also, a Venturi effect if you've got a tube. And these two try to gravitate toward each other, but they will not touch each other because if you look, here's another example of it. If you brought these two together, these two vector arrows would collide and these things would bounce apart. So they love each other at a distance, they hate each other close, and they come to a locked orbit with each other automatically. You don't have to steer them. They will suck together and, and orbit around each other. Now, if you have three craft, it conserves in that same way, coming from here and going like that. They will lock into their own orbits out there. And they won't go together here because these two will conflict. So it'll hang this guy out here. He'll come up to a point of equilibrium. Same thing for this guy with an interlock there and uh, interlocks there. That's, I'm, I'm reasonably certain, why these things fly in formation. It is a practical function. And I assume if you have feedback between the craft, you can have one that changes the direction of them just like a, a flock of birds does. So the lead bird changes, they all change following the flow. Some years ago, a lot of years ago, I guess, I started realizing that there was something to an inertial phenomenon called a smoke ring. We did a lot of research in our laboratories uh, in this country, and um, some of the research um, caused us a bit of grief. We hurt some people because the, uh, we weren't quite aware that it was going to do what it did. So what I'm going to show you here today is uh, some of the lab tests that we did that we, we modified for people. Like that. You okay? Good. Don't die on me. I did this to a friend of mine in Perth, and he was uh, holding the glasses of the, uh, the uh, port on the uh, living room carpet now. And uh, I've since tried to choose my targets a little more wisely. I'll just let you feel it. Don't panic. You'll all get hit. Now, if you were to try to blow across a room filled with smoke or take a cigar and inhale a big puff of it and blow as far as I just shot that toroid with more energy even, most of the energy would never get there. Because in a, in a room, if you blow like this, you have this partial curl develop, just like we were looking at here with the flying saucers. You blow this way into a room, let's say one air molecule like that. It hits two other air mo molecules that deflect off. They hit two, which deflect off. And they hit two, which deflect off. Eventually, you see a curl forming. But when you just blow into a room, these curls go everywhere, and the energy from your puff gets distributed over here. And for me to transfer that much energy to you, I'd have to have a really hard system, let it blow for a while, and eventually you get a breeze over there. With these things, uh, the uh, toroidal gun I was just showing you, they have shot them clear across uh, football fields and knocked ladies' skirts loose at the World's Fair and things like that in Chicago. It's not a new thing, it's just not widely known. Using this technique, there is a way to develop a new kind of propulsion, well, new for us, to discover a new kind of uh, propulsion. Now, what I'm going to do is show you real smoke rings in action. We've filmed them, and we've run slow motion. Now, what I want you to watch, there's a little bit of music and calm you down now, then after all the, the trauma back there. Watch this uh, video of about two or three minutes, uh, and watch the, uh, the large, invisible smoke ring that we shoot. It's, a, it's a, just an air toroid. It's going to rip through a cloud formation, an artificial one we made in the lab. When it goes through, instead of blowing the cloud apart, it opens a hole and closes it behind it. It is a philosophical principle as much as a physics principle. You don't shove your way through the environment. You curl and let the curl open a doorway for you. Ask, may I come in your form of vacuum? And you fill that vacuum behind you. The passing that your craft makes, or your object makes, going through any medium then, puts a shockwave out at right angles, not in front of you. Now, what this means, digested, is you're going to see a way in concept to build a craft that will exceed the light wave velocity by many orders. I sometimes marvel that Gene Roddenberry did Star Trek so long ago, and he said, let's call it warp factor one, two, three, or, or whatever, because literally what we're going to see here is warping of the medium to let you pass through without resistance uh, beyond just the surface skin. 
As you go faster, you will not increase your resistance. That's the gun I just shot you with. Uh, rubber diaphragm, a polished sharp edge in a circular form uh, to increase this rate of curl here as the air passes over it rather rapidly. Now look in the center of this. Did you see it? Now those are traveling at about the speed we just saw, around 90 kilometers an hour. A lot of the uh, flying saucer or UFO reports of the past have talked about things uh, zipping along the clouds and not leaving thunderclaps or shockwaves, and I firmly believe it's something similar to this effect that is causing that. Now watch this one here. It's going to come back and forth. There's a cloud formation. Imagine that's a UFO with its toroidal field around it. I'm ripping through. I'm just going to back it up in slow motion so you can get the feel for it. See how it rolls right through it? It's almost like a heart valve working. <clears throat> Such a simple thing, and we haven't even begun to scratch the surface this, I must tell you, because we find already that when these things are accelerated faster and faster, that a secondary effect occurs in the shape of that toroid that we had never even um, thought about. When the uh, uh, smoke ring starts to move through the environment in this direction here, um, looking at it like this, you don't see the effect in, until, it, uh, until it reaches a critical velocity, but little satellite rings form around it like this. So if you're looking at it from the top, 
you'd have the donut, and you would have these kind of rings in orbit around it, but part of it. I'm not doing a good job of the artwork. And they're equally spaced. And this is, again, a conservation of momentum, because we found out what happens is as these things rip along, depending upon how you produce them, you form a low pressure area, uh, layers and layers of low pressure area inside this shell here, which, which um, try to condense with such force that uh, they, pull, they pull dents into this and they pull air in from out here or smoke from out here inside into these channels and back out and they form these loops. Now, this is bordering on the, um, the quantum jump in the, uh, the atom going from a low energy state to the next one. It takes a discrete amount of energy until the inertia uh, imbalance down in here actually causes something to be pulled in from here and form a node to, to loop around like that. So in our contingent models for nuclear physics at the, for, uh, for atoms at the moment, we are looking at um, these uh, spinning vortices which form a spherical uh, uh, bisymmetry uh, globe with little spinning vortices around, much like the planet Jupiter except much more ordered. These are all about one, one angstrom in uh, diameter within plus or minus just a tiny bit. Now, about five years ago in this country, when I was still um, thinking wonderful things about the system and how to uh, patent uh, devices, I um, drew up a patent for a device called a VIA drive, V-I-A, a vertical insertion accelerator. Um, Alan Holt at NASA, who has also uh, filed a couple of papers with the AIAA, uh, has um, called his asymmetric propulsion. And the reason he has is that normally, if you're going to go that way in a rocket, you build your rocket here, and you thrust exhaust gases that way, and by Newton's law equal and opposite reaction, your vehicle goes that way. This action is symmetric around this point here, equal and opposite reactions this side to that side. If you walk across the ground, your feet push that way and your body goes this way. Your car does the same thing, an aircraft does the thing, same thing, a jet does the same thing, a bird does the same thing. Virtually every way of motivation you understand does that. However, I'm going to stand here and tell you that you can make a boat make an aircraft, a spacecraft, and if you want to go that way, you eject whatever you're going to eject, field or particles or whatever, in front of you in the direction you want to go and you will follow behind it. Does that seem hard to believe? Nod your head, yes. This is one of our test models, the shark boat. I've taken the power pack off because it's not really necessary here. If you look at it on the bottom, you see what appear to be gills and a slit at the front. This boat we designed uh, by computer to work uh, on the surface of the water and obviously part of it in the air. It has to work in two media. It has to work under power and when the power is turned off. Our objective with this particular device, which we filed on, was to make a safe pleasure craft that used half the fuel and went just as fast. To make this work, we shoot a thin film of water in pulses out the front, and they curl around this lip and into the intake for the pump. These are all intakes. We build up a wave, which is like a, a roller bearing of water, and we surf on that wave. It's a little pimple that comes up in the water. This is an actual working craft. It comes up like this. When it first starts, it does a little back step like that, because we've just shot some water out the front. It goes back like that until the field forms or the loop, and then it takes off. It doesn't leave a weight behind it, except for this little drag point here. We're going to remove that shortly. It doesn't leave a bow wave because there is no pushing through the water. It sucks itself through the water. And when... Oh, it be the death of me yet. They're there watching, I know. <laughs> Here's our shark boat. Well, reasonable representation of it, I guess. Uh, let's let it go that way. Here's our shark boat, and he's going to go that way. When we looked at it in the swimming pools we were testing it in, 
ripples formed around the craft and went with it. And they're not magic, they are pressure waves. Instead of having a bow wave shoved this way, what the craft did, because it was, it was recirculating part of the energy of going back into its intakes, is looking at the water line, we saw this. Here's where the boat is. That's good. <laughs> I must tell you, I must tell you, I was talking to a group of people years ago, a young uh, teenage group uh, in, in a house in Perth, and we were discussing weird and wonderful things about what if they and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it was a very tense and quiet moment thinking about what would happen if one actually landed and suddenly, whoom! this great huge jumbo jet off course at the airport came over to the house. <laughs> well, they were laying on the floors and uh, kicked chairs over and, you know, good thing they were young, they'd have been dead. <laughs> mind you, mind you, it reminds me of another story with this UFO business. I was asked to speak to a Jewish women's league group at a home a little time after that. And one of their sons was a friend of mine and he was out for, you know, a date. And so I was talking to them and discussing, you know, great, uh, you know, philosophical issues. And uh, one of the uh, ladies about 19 odd out says to me, hey, what do, you, what do you think about UFOs? I thought, oh, that's good. And so we got to talking and it got quiet again because they're all just like, yes, well, yeah. And I said, just imagine what would happen if right out here tonight, out in your yard, one of them came along and landed. Door opens, out they come, up to your front door and knock on it. And we're talking about like that. And suddenly, bang on the front door, it's her son coming home. And I thought we killed one of them, actually. She was on the floor prostrate for three minutes. <laughs> okay, pressure waves. You see those? Good. Now, to the people uh, here and also in um, Houston, I must address this to John Schusler. John, watch this. We have a certain amount of energy required in time period one to move the craft that way one unit. And if we recirculate part of that energy instead of letting it be wasted in minus E1 drag, if we take it over to position two where E2 and E1 are supposed to equal and we recycle part of this as curl, which we just did, even if we put 10% with that, our power requirement has dropped 10% immediately in the next time pulse. There is a limit series function for the friction or drag on any surface. So I want you to consider that when you do it. And this is how we make the Lorenzo work. Okay. Now the commercial's over. Get down to business. The Germans had a lot of trouble with this effect, actually, uh, with this uh, curl effect. It can work against you. If you have a rocket sitting here on a pad, trying to take off on just flat ground, on flat ground, uh, the rocket will shoot exhaust down, which curls around to the top of the rocket and holds it down. And many of the early German B1, B2 tests, or B2 tests on the, on the, uh, the pad, show the rocket going Technically, I mean, they weren't silly. They knew what the power requirements were. They calculated the mass the payload would lift off, and it'd go, mm, fall over several times. And then you see they got smart. And underneath their pad, they put one of these. And here's their rocket up here, sort of. And the exhaust went like this and curled out. And then they built other shields. And eventually at NASA, if you'll notice, at the uh, NASA Houston, when the rocket launches here and shoots its exhaust down, there's a great underground tunnel that goes off into the lake over there. And the exhaust is taken clear away to get rid of the ground effect. That's what it's called, the ground effect. Originally known as the A-4, the V-2 tests at Pinamunde were plagued by costly disasters and setbacks. Uh, there was some other phenomena that they had to deal with. Uh, you try to launch a vehicle from, from the Earth and uh, have it setting down fairly close to the Earth. The rocket plume, the exhaust gases, when it came out, would have a tendency to come back up and put forces on the vehicle, and the vehicle was marginally stable at best at low low velocities and frequently those forces would uh, would topple it over or you would get a, a, a cavitation on one side of the nozzle the thrust would decrease on that side and that would put an unsymmetrical force on the vehicle and tend to tilt the vehicle then in 1943 the missile made its first successful flight traveling 118 miles in just 269 seconds what works against us really can work for us with a lot less energy. So let's look at the first test 
after the war that we know of anyway publicly by Avro Limited in Canada where they built a flying saucer. I've actually got to to play with it, not fly it, but um, it was a, a one or two man tactical craft to get to 10,000 feet altitude, fly it three to 400 miles per hour. Had a number of technical problems, which I'll summarize rather than go through the whole tape on it. Um, the project was officially discontinued in 1962. The device used a Pratt & Whitney, uh, well, three Pratt & Whitney uh, jet engines that blew on a rotor uh, turbine in the center of the donut shaped craft to suck air in and blow it out the bottom through a control ring to take the craft off. They had a lot, a lot of problem getting it to lift off the ground because it locked itself in. Some of the footage I'm going to show you here shows it flying over the snow in a test uh, on the field there. And you'll see the curl because the snow follows the curl and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. In the most recent configuration with the addition of the pneumatic control boost, the vehicle displayed stable flight characteristics at a height of three feet and at speeds up to 30 knots. The wind tunnel test data showed, however, that the focusing ring control, though it had been developed for satisfactory hovering, was not good enough for forward flight and that fairly extensive modifications were required to add an improved forward flight control system. Now watch the curl in the snow. The focusing control ring, which resulted in the most significant improvement to date. See it right there. Now, I hear probably a lot of the same rumors, perhaps a few more uh, than you do about uh, what's going on in uh, the government uh, in Bay's secret research projects and whatever. And certainly they're entertaining. And uh, over the years, I've learned to take more caution in uh, investigating the source of the rumors and trying to get to the bottom of them if they're correct. And I came across one um, that is not a rumor. We were filming at uh, Houston at NASA a few years ago to make uh, the documentary called The Cosmic Conspiracy. And the Australian film crew and I were sitting there. And um, the chap and the, uh, we didn't have any astronauts or anything like that. We had engineers we were talking to, propulsion engineers. And we had one guy by the name of uh, Henry Pohl, P-O-H-L. Now, um, Henry, we didn't introduce ourselves really properly. I was just uh, supposed to be a, a news presenter from Australia just doing a story, a current interest thing on NASA. And so we were just talking about, you know, normal pedestrian type things and so he wasn't really on guard and we asked him a rather um, a leading question about um, propulsion developments in NASA and uh, one of the things he stated was we have used chemical rockets just about to the extent of their um, or to the maximum of their efficiency we're going to have to devise some kind of new kind of propulsion well, I said, oh, gee, what would that be? And he says, uh, well, some kind of electrical um, uh, propulsion. We're actually looking at it now. I said, oh, yeah. He said, somewhat like anti-gravity. So you listen for this guy's words. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to we tape it. I want you to hear it. Because um, uh, the cameraman nearly dropped the camera when he said it. <laughs> Being cool. Or we've gone for main engine start. The thing that we need now is we need a breakthrough in a new concept in propulsion. That when we talk about chemical propulsion, we have stretched it just about as far as we can. What we need is an anti-gravitational device or something like that. Do you think that is possible? Who knows? Anything in the, in the future is possible. Okay, that was Dr. Henry Pohl. Oh, by the way, when this missile starts, to, or when this shuttle starts to take off, look at the, uh, the ring that forms the exhaust. You don't want to watch that. We, that was at Universal's uh, studios in uh, California. We borrowed their um, Battlestar Galactica set, I think, and uh, we nearly parted our cameraman's hair too close with a laser because those are hot lasers and he was up on top of a van moving along the track on top of it instead of down at normal level where it was programmed for and uh, Jack just uh, raised up like this and was getting a shot on us down there in the action and uh, whew, one of the automatic fires went right over the top of him he had words words I look at the uh, pyramids for example and I am not convinced that we did not at that time have some type of 
anti-gravitational device that assisted those people in putting those huge stones in place. I, I think it was possible then. I think it is possible in the future that we will come up with some technique that can uh, allow us to lift enormous masses with very little force and uh, very an expenditure of very little energy. How many of you have seen the uh, the Meyer uh, beam ship contact story tape? This is an excerpt from that. This is where we pull that. How many of you believe that those flying saucer things are real that Meyer had? Hey, no one. That's sad. You believe it's real. Why do you believe it's real? It looks real. Sounds real. So, so you, it's your brother-in-law. No, brother. Your brother, and he's been in contact with uh, with Bill Meyer. Yes, um, one particular video he did send over, which um, apparently was uh, investigated by a scientific team from Japan. Um, they did uh, find out that apparently um, the ships that they were videotaping were emitting some strange electric fields that were killing any plants and things like that this? were under them. What I want to know is, did your, did your uh, brother um, see any of the models that Meyer had in the, in the garage out the back, or that shed? Because I heard some of the people said that, that Billy had a, uh, some models they found later out the back. Well, to my knowledge, I don't know about that. Um, he's still in the process of getting information from him. One of the things I found interesting about this, it's on this tape here, if you've all seen it, that's fine, is when the, the craft runs next to that tree. The shock wave comes uh, delayed as a, as a pulse hit. And we tried to figure out a number of ways that they could take a model and do that and couldn't come up with a good answer because it seems to come from outside the tree and move it. But it has a characteristic of something that's more of a, um, a delayed thrust uh, aircraft engine than a toroidal donut. Because so these smoke rings that we shoot, when they come past you, as they come past, they lower the pressure at right angles as they pass you. And it pulls you out that way. When we look at the tree here in the, in the Meyer uh, second, uh, session, his, his tree is here and his UFO comes like that. And as the UFO gets up here, gone now, then, then the tree gets this. Now we have noticed this effect with our toroids. If you shoot it strong enough and change direction, a second toroid seems to form out the back, a bigger one, and, and lag behind, kind of like a, a circular shock wave. It, it, it follows in. It's worth watching the whole thing. Um, it's kind of hard, I guess, asking you what you think about it if you haven't seen it. But um, um, I think there's a real flying craft for several, in fact, involved here. We've got quite a few uh, large blow-ups of the film, actual film, not videotape that was shot, and have compared them with what we know about the situation uh, at propulsion. And it would seem, this, this is an unusual thing, it would seem that since the 50s, when we started rediscovering UFOs or something, that the early ones were crude Adamski type things, uh, uh, no real sexy lines or anything, just kind of bells and half bells. And then magically over the last 30 years, these have improved. Now, if these are from an advanced culture, either a lot of the cultures out there do it a different way and bring neater, better models in in the last 30 years, or it's some that we have made and we're improving them, you know, mankind. Um, I'm not saying it's the answer, but I'm saying I'm, I'm being critical of the data trying to see whether this, this increase in the shape and the modeling of the UFO shapes, and there are several of them in here, is a product of man's playing with it and getting better and better models um, for whatever purpose uh, they would use it for shortly. There are new photos too and more film. In some, the beam ship hovers by a tree. Maya says they use trees as a kind of magnetic ground. Two or more ships in the same shot are almost unheard of in UFO photos. Maya has dozens of such pictures. Ships below a horizon line, such as a hill, are even rarer. In this photo, a Variation 2 ship controls a smaller unmanned drone ship, designated as Variation 5. In one demonstration, a Variation 3 ship exhibits a behavior Stevens has seen before. We have often reported a nipping flight. We also have a wobbling flight, where it wobbles around a vertical axis. 
The bobbing effect, Meyer explains, is due to the ship riding the waves of the Earth's magnetic field, much as a boat on the ocean. Uh -huh. What size um, is that ship, Billy? They told me it's seven meters. One of the most frequent spots for the contacts is Obersadeleg, a wide valley just 10 minutes from the farm at Schmidruti. Here, Meyer took one of his most spectacular series of photographs. They're setting up a laser imaging system here in that paddock to test and see how far away the object would have been to move that tree and what kind of performance it would have had. Uh -huh. Objects such as the trees in the hills are translated into pixels. They just go into a lot of analysis they've done on pixel imaging and edge definition to see if these are fakes or models put into the picture later. And uh, as far as I can see on what they've done, it's, uh, it's been a fair assessment. They've even hung models, out, hung models out like this to try to see uh, if he was faking it with a shorthand model. They took these back for photo analysis in uh, Texas and were able to prove immediately on screen that this was a model versus a real object because a real object will have shaded, contoured pixels coming in, whereas a flat or, or a shallow object like that will have no depth in it if it's up close in your photograph. Anyway, you can see that when you see the documentary, if you do. In one demonstration, the beam ship flies around a tree, which can be seen to sway in the backwash. Once again, in slow motion. even slower. Later, Semyasi brings a new beam ship to pose for Maya's cameras. The variation quite unlike anything he has seen before. She explains, as best you can understand it, the function of the spheres for propulsion of the craft in interstellar travel. The sound of the new beam ship shows marked differences to the sounds of the other variation craft. Maya tapes these as well. It's interesting to note, bearing in mind what Bruce Cathy was saying earlier today, that the sound waves they recorded from these um, sightings, or contacts, um, or a series of very complex harmonic waves that shift their nodes or, or their, uh, their alignment uh, constantly. Everything does seem to come back, even if you're using um, donuts or toroids, to harmonic motion of some type, periodic motion, that causes uh, things to move across space at a great rate of knots. I'm going to put on a tape before we go to break. Uh, during the break, if you want to watch uh, more of it, you can. Um, this is uh, a public release tape on the... Um, the bomber, the B-1 bomber, and the, uh, several of the uh, skunk works, what they call the skunk works aircraft that were developed in the United States. This is, um, again, for public uh, uh, consumption, and uh, it tells you apparently the, the state of our technology. What you must read between the lines uh, is that this technology is now so outdated that they can tell you about it. Uh, and I was reasonably impressed with the work they had done on these crafts and the design. It runs for uh, quite a bit. So um, I'll put it on and um, race through a couple of things so we get past the commercial of it. And um, I want you to look at the various surfaces, the shape of the, the later craft toward the end, which are kind of scimitar shape. Uh, and these are all real craft that, that are flying. I mean, they tell you who did it, which company's done it. They brag about it. And uh, these have speeds which are nowhere near what we're going to see in the second half uh, from some footage that the boys in uh, Houston sent me out of STS-48 shuttle mission. Uh, but still, it's uh, worth seeing what they've, uh, what they've said to, is our current state of technology. The SR-71 Blackbird. This big black monster can maintain a cruising speed of 2,300 miles an hour and at a height of 95,000 feet. It holds all the current aircraft speed, altitude, and speed over distance records. For years, it was one of the tightest held secrets in the Western world. An immensely powerful, blindingly fast superplane. It was designed to be flown against the most sophisticated air defenses in the world.
as it gently bobs on subsonic air, take a close look at the world's fastest airplane. The reason it's so fast is the same reason a Formula One race car is fast. It has an incredibly high power to weight ratio. Weight has been kept down by building the SR-71 almost entirely out of titanium, one of the lightest metals on Earth. The strength comes from its two unique Pratt & Whitney engines, each rated at 35,000 pounds of thrust, enough to drive the world's largest ocean tankers. They had stopped trying to design a plane with a low RCS. They were going to design a low RCS and then make it fly. Hal Blue was virtually undetectable by radar. While most modern fighters have a radar cross-section the size of a house, the combination of shaping and ram gave the F-117A an RCS about the size of a small bird. It is deceptive, isn't it? Just looking at the shape makes you think it's about the size of a sports plane. In fact, the 117A is an impressively large two-engined aircraft about the size of an F-18. Because its shape is so critical, its 4,000 pounds of smart weapons are carried internally. And even its pitot tubes, or airspeed sensors, have specially designed faceted faces. section I'm going to show you a way to get the magic source of power that everyone keeps talking about doesn't seem to know where it is rather than uh, talk about pyramid power or esoteric things that none of us seem to be able to get working models in our hand my engineers and I have sat down on our own time and tried to analyze every known patented written about kind of energy free energy device that there is and try to draw parallels in the data we could get from each one. And there's a lot of data to sift through even by computer. And we found correlations, uh, thermal correlations, um, uh, electromagnetic correlations, power correlations, a number of things that were same in all of them, including one guy who's alive and well now with the hydrogen uh, oxygen uh, splitting process that is a cool process, uh, a man by the name of Mayer. And I write about that in the uh, New Cosmic Conspiracy in the back. You can find it in the index. His description of his device is almost identical at this moment to where Ed and I, our, our senior engineer of the project, are today. We know where the energy is. Uh, Bruce mentioned it to you, but uh, I will tell you in quantitative terms where this energy is. You're sitting right in the middle of it. Why you have not been able to access it before. It exists everywhere in the universe as far as we can see. <laughs> and the big trick has been the second law of thermodynamics, how to get around it. It's not a law, it's an axiom, an observation. Stanton Friedman and Bill Moore met with me in, um, in uh, a little town near the College of Yappa Pi in um, Arizona once, uh, back in 83, I think. And they really amazed me because we, I went to their lecture and sat out there like you're doing, and then after it was over, we had dinner at about 1 o'clock in an all-night diner in this little one-horse town. And after we'd had dinner and everybody was kind of relaxed, um, Moore puts kind of like this, leans over the table, and he says, well, um, you know, if you could tell me a word, I could tell you the rest of this, because I know what's happening. I said, a word? He said, yeah, you tell me one word, the right word, and I'll take you out in the parking lot, and I'll tell you the whole story. Ah, says I, the word. <laughs> and uh, so the game was on. I thought, right, 
Oh, I'll play your game. I said, oh, yeah, I know the word. It's not really a word, it's two words. It's an animal and a color. I said it that quick. Stanton Friedman sitting to the right says, Golden Eagle, you mean? I said, uh, no. Now, I was using an old phrase we use at the Academy, Blue Eagle, or Blue Falcon, sorry, Blue Falcon, which means a high flyer out in the cold when you're cut off from the organization. But what amazed me was I said nothing, and, and, and Friedman comes up and says, Gold Eagle. I said, an animal and a color. He says, not any animal. He says, an eagle, which is an, you know, in the Falcon family. And he says, Gold Eagle, not blue, but gold. They didn't say any more. Moore says, no, that's not it. I said, well, okay, then I can't tell you mine either because you got the wrong one, and so we, we drew an impasse. What bothered me was that I thought these guys were just as straight as an arrow, and there was no cover-up. And here they are telling me a few hours before, aliens are here. They showed me pictures and stuff like this in my hotel room back in 83. And they were coming on from the position, they are here. Well, certainly they may be. But it worried me that it was under a code sign. And these guys are out here telling the UFO crowds various things and saying, we've got to do something about this cover-up, blah, blah, blah. And they're part of the cover-up. I don't understand. Maybe I misunderstood. If you're listening, guys, if you see this tape, uh, I'd appreciate a letter. Not from your solicitors, either. When I was in the States in 1983 on the uh, filming uh, tour through there, uh, I was privileged with the film crew to be invited in to see Townsend Brown's laboratory, what was left of it, the one that he used in 1958 to do these uh, experimental flying disc experiments in. Um, at the time, we could not tell anyone or show you what we filmed inside the lab, and what you're going to see here was filmed a long time before we went. Uh, 30 years or so before we went, 12, 25 years, I guess. And um, the, the management of the particular company that owned the Bonson Corporation then, at the time we were visiting in 1983, told us that we could film it, I could go in and play and touch the equipment and whatever. It was under, uh, underground, under their building in uh, Salem, North Carolina. It was the Bonson uh, company, which was uh, one of the companies that supplied nuclear uh, or air conditioning for nuclear power plants. So it was a sensitive area, and we had to have kind of temporary clearance to get down in there. But they did let us go in. They moved the concrete and steel door aside on, on the rollers, and I got to go in to, to see what was left of the equipment, most of it, in fact. So they said if we um, told anyone where we had gotten this, we could show portions of it if we told them where it was. Uh, I think, to quote him loosely, they would jump on me from a great high height. And uh, I believed him um, and his deputies and whoever were there in the room. So with that to risk, we went ahead and filmed and picked up. I played with this particular craft, which is about, uh, I think it's about four feet in uh, diameter. Since that time, uh, the family, the, the Bonson family, who had all the, the, this instrumentation of Townsend Browns, sold the entire thing to a fellow in the United States who was going to make like a museum of it and let us all share in it and get the lab notebooks and all that kind of stuff. This fellow turned around and then sold half of it off to a crowd in Canada uh, against the family's wishes. They didn't know about it until it was too late. So his laboratory and a lot of the equipment is now fragmented. So the thing left was the five notebooks which had his research day by day in it, plus a movie film in 16 mil, about 45 minutes worth, that I have because about, I don't know, 10 years ago, I went to the family, uh, to the Bonson family, and I said, look, uh, I'd like to see if you've got any artifacts uh, left from your dad's lab and stuff, anything else other than lab books. Uh, if you find anything, let me know. And they didn't have anything when I was there, and I came home. And one of the boys, uh, the Bonson boys, I think it was Frank, rang me. And he said, oh, look, you never guess what we found out at the farm, the family farm, out in the barn under the haystack out in the back with all the junk, found a box full of film. It looks like it was something from the lab. And it was in really, really bad condition, 16 mil film, home movie stuff without sound, and in fragments, and it was breaking. I said, look, clean it up as best you can. Don't, don't open reels. Send it to New York to the NFL film labs. And they have what's called a fluid gate printer. And scratchy, terrible film goes through this fluid gate printer and it fills the scratches, and it comes out better than the original. And what you're seeing here is off my original, or my copy of the original. The original is now, with age, totally falling apart. Um, and, and, and it's destroyed. So I have the only remaining copy uh, of the laboratory stuff. It's out of sequence. And I've compiled some of it in, in time sequence here so you can see it in its proper order. And it's only just a little bit because it, it gets pretty boring watching people in black suits running around and blackboards and uh, 
you know, because you can't hear what they're saying. But with the lab notes, we've now gotten the five lab notebooks. Uh, we did it the legal way through a company that bought the rights to the patents and things that ensued from Townsend Brown's work. And uh, they said they had gotten all the use out of the patents they wanted and that the documents they would give to us would not compromise them in any way. So now I have the five notebooks. Having said all of that, there was only a few pieces of the research, which is enough, in all of these uh, 600 and, uh, 625 pages of notebook, there's only a few odd things in there that would give us a clue to where the energy was and the propulsive mechanism that he was looking for. He didn't find it at the time. I know because, well, I say I know he, he said he didn't on the phone when we talked. Anyhow, what we have here is some footage from that laboratory. So we are now, we've backed it up and we're going to back up more film, actual film rather than videotape, film copies of this in the United States now because the work did actually contribute quite a bit to our understanding of the medium of space-time. Now, both of these men are dead now. The fellow on the right is Agnew H. Bonson. He was the owner of the company, uh, of the Bonson uh, Air Conditioning Company at that time. Had his own, his own private uh, aircraft. Uh, I believe it was a twin engine job. Uh, he was killed in that aircraft, landing at an airport that he had landed at for many, many times, a private field near the house. Um, he uh, had landed from this approach many times. There's a power, uh, power line uh, at the end of the runway. And uh, he clipped it with his uh, nose wheel and he never landed, he even told the boys, never land with a full nose tank. And he landed with a full nose tank, and he, he uh, landed at a familiar field, but he clipped the wire with his front wheel and was burned to death at the bottom of the runway. And the research stopped after that. Townsend Brown left uh, before that happened and was over in California doing uh, continued research in various high voltage experiments. Townsend Brown's the guy on the left. You'll see him probably in some of these shots, I think it's his left hand, there's a finger totally missing. Um, that's the price of uh, science. He was working a model of a flying saucer shape that they were gonna test in the voltage chamber on the lathe, and he got his ring finger caught and lost his finger. He died, by the way, of uh, lung cancer. When I was dealing with him, he had a quarter of a lung left, and it was quite difficult for him to speak. But um, I'd say probably natural causes for both of them, even though it seems a bit sus with the aircraft. There's another player in here, this fellow here, James Frank King. He was a good friend, and uh, he died um, last year. He was an aeronautical engineer, and he uh, worked for this company, and he was a brother-in-law to um, the Bonson Company, uh, to, uh, to Agnew Bonson. He um, eventually filed several patents, and you saw him a while ago in that um, red shirt with the yellow checked lines on it, talking about what they had done, and uh, he tried to patent a flying sauce from the governor's top. That was him as an older man. It was uh, through his um, keeping uh, certain records and giving it to me in a deceased estate transfer that we got a, a number of things that we're still working on, including some information on the Mori valve. That's a beta machine, just a high voltage positive ion generator, specially made, there were two of them made. Most of that stuff in there is high voltage um, test equipment. Uh, for the time, it was quite advanced. And that's um, the flying disc. If you watch it close on the left-hand side, you'll see arcs shoot out from the rim to the center as the voltage exceeds the breakdown voltage of the air in the room. Now, the thing starts to move. It's because they are pulsing the, the high voltage generator and getting a dielectric movement effect in the uh, atmosphere, which causes the craft to move. It's nowhere near what they needed to uh, make a working big model. Now, let's uh, watch right over on the left hand. See that? Vacuum chamber, they did their test in to, uh, to do the absolute measurements on the electrostatic force and the dielectric medium of the air and various other uh, plastics that they put in there. Fortunately, they um, recorded the dates on camera like this, which helped us tie them to the, uh, the diaries. Just for your information, there's a crowd in the United States, uh, a guy named Charles Yost, Y-O-S-T, in Asheville, North Carolina same state where all this was done, who puts out a quarterly journal called the Electric Spacecraft Journal. Uh, I'll be referring to that document in a minute with some of the uh, technology they have uh, put in this uh, journal. And this is all very, very solid physics, but very new and, um, and quite interesting phenomenon uh, in, as far as power production and propulsion. 
he, um, he has uh, access to three or four of the Brown uh, lab notebooks. He doesn't have uh, notebook number four, which we'll be supplying to him shortly. This is worthy of note. You know the um, Adamski-type craft. George Adamski was a longtime associate of Agnew Bonson. And one of the things that I inherited in this deceased estate was a stack of correspondence between Adamski and, um, and uh, Agnew Bonson. And Adamski kept tapping Bonson for cash, saying, they told me to do this, and uh, you can make a, a neat flying saucer this way. And I think quite seriously that Adamski probably set back research, serious research, a lot by taking advantage of Bonson's good heart and interest in the fact that space people might be here telling this guy Adamski. But if you read through it all, all the correspondence which we've done, Adamski, I think, was taking Bonson for a ride, which is sad. But uh, that's the Adamski craft. And so they tried to make an Adamski-type craft work with their electrostatic research. Uh, I think perhaps had they not been tied to that design, they could have moved ahead a little bit faster with better results. Somewhere along here, this particular model does reasonably good as far, there it is. Does a little jig in the air. It's still tethered to the power source and it's a brute force device, doesn't use toroids at all. Here we go. Now did you catch the lightning flash on the right hand side? There you go. That's because the voltage is just too high and it's arcing out. When it arcs, the thing crashes. There it is lifting a, um, it, it's counterweighted with a, a wrench. They tried a vast number of dielectric materials, insulating materials and shapes. Uh, you're looking at about um, a year and a half summary of their activities from week to week. They would film when they had something new to put down. Now, this part here was interesting to us. The notes that went with this section here with that curled charred shell on that um, thing there. An interesting thing happens. When you have a charged curled surface like that, it increases the intensity of the electric field, just like it was light focusing down at that bulb in the center. And by using hemispheres of this, you can create some rather interesting uh, rectified and high voltage effects using various media in between, which is that little red line he's got in between there. It's these incredible forces that uh, spurred us on to our um, our thermionic conversion process, which I want to get to after Philadelphia experiment. The reason we're playing Brown's tape here is that he was associated with the Philadelphia experiment by his own admission. But also by his own admission, it was not quite as dramatic as William Moore made it in his book, The Philadelphia Experiment, with him and Charles Berlitz. Um, Moore wrote a, um, a very interesting book, and I couldn't fault a lot of the stuff that he was um, he was saying in the book as far as what had happened in Philadelphia experiment, but some of the things that he attributed to Brown were incorrect because Brown wasn't as high, highly placed in the project as, as Moore would have made him. And the project, um, uh, I'm sure much to the disappointment of the Beelik uh, fans in the audience, did not actually send somebody forward in time and then back again. They did move forward um, in time a few minutes uh, and never came back. And uh, this is not as difficult as you would think. Uh, if we were to put you in total suspended animation in a freeze chamber, we could move you forward in time as far as you're concerned, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, and if we could thaw you without bursting your cells, we could bring you back, and as far as you're concerned, you jumped ahead in time. You'd never be able to go back, but you would now come out virtually unaged in the future. And this Philadelphia experiment, something like that happened, as I'm going to tell you all the information I've got, and, and tell you how the, uh, I told um, Dr. Tapper how I thought it went, and which he confirmed, uh, and you'll see uh, where some of the, the, uh, the rumors uh, derive from. When we see what I'm after here, we'll get down to um, a uh, test tube full of water, electrode in it, and um, we run current through this uh, test tube full of water in a magnetic field around it, and it causes the water to spin in a vortex. Now, this particular thing was shown to me by an individual in... Um, <coughs> Uh, an ex-individual in uh, intelligence uh, for uh, a European uh, country. Um, he tried to explain to me how post-World War II flying saucers... Ah, I forgot about this. When Bruce was showing you the antennae in the bottom of the ocean, this was in Townsend Brown's lab. In that bell jar. Here it comes, just after this calendar stuff. Does that look like his antenna? 
as far as I can determine from the notes, he was varying the spread angle between those two charged uh, series to get an effect, the Byfield Brown effect it's called. Um, I don't know how that would connect to the antenna that, that uh, Bruce saw, but it, uh, it, it certainly leapt out of the pages at me when I saw that. Now, we're looking for the Lorentz drive. Here we go. Flying saucers work off a basic principle of electrodynamic physics, the Lorentz force. To illustrate this force, we take a glass tube with a hollow brass electrode in one end, sealed with a rubber plug. Next, we take the ring magnets from three old speaker cones, hollow so that the glass tube will fit down inside the magnets. We will fill the tube with salt water and a small amount of hydrochloric acid to simulate ionized air. To the hollow electrode, we will attach the cathode of our 60 volt direct current power source. To a rod inserted in the top of the tube with a rubber stopper, we will attach the anode of our DC power source. Then, when we push the button, the water ions, like the air ions, begin to bend around in a fast spiral between the electrodes. It is the Lorentz force which exists between any non-parallel conductors that makes the ions spin without any turbines, vanes, or other moving parts. Nikola Tesla designed a cigar-shaped craft based on the principle over 60 years ago. The modern version is donut-shaped, however, to take advantage of recycling effects which Tesla wasn't even aware of at the time. Air is heated in the center here, inside the hollow tube at the bottom. The air is then started or primed into a spiral motion by a flat starter turbine which disengages after the system is self-sustaining. Once the hot spiraling air is moving between the magnetic field coils, shown in the cross-section here, the alternating current heater current is turned off and a direct current is then switched on. As the air begins to spin, it pulls a partial vacuum in the center of the chamber, causing the gas conductivity to increase dramatically. At the same time, the air is heating up more rapidly because of the higher current DC flowing in it, thus again increasing the conductivity of the whole system and making it spin faster and faster. Now, yeah. the Philadelphia experiment, you had to see this before I could get to that. We have found, and certainly I don't understand all the mechanism that we're playing with, but we have found that if you take a coil of wire like this, and around that coil of wire you wrap another coil of wire like so, two independent circuits. And in the center of all this, what it's wrapped around is something like this. And this, in cross-section, is a square cross-section like that. This being some sort of what is called a mu, mu metal. A mu metal that is a very permeable metal that lets magnetic fields permeate it rapidly. With iron, soft iron, um, when you pass a current through a coil wrapped around the iron, any one of these, uh, either one of these coils, it causes the actual uh, molecules of the iron to move, to stress, to polarize and form domains. When you release the current and there's no more electricity flowing into the wire, then these stretched or stressed molecules in the iron cause a back current, a back EMF, as they move back to where they belong. And the electricity then runs back out the wire in the opposite direction. If you could get rid of this and cause the stress in the iron to develop into spin rather than recoil, then you could pump this at the right frequency for iron of that thickness, and you could then dynamically pulse that, uh, that piece of iron so that you stack energy into it and raise its energy level and spin sharing it among the lattices. So to do this, we, Ed and I, some of the people working on this together, worked for a long time figuring out how we would get the, the phase angles match between these two coils so that when this coil fired into the iron and then that coil stopped, just as it was stopping and the rush was 
just about to hit, we would hit it with a pulse from a coil at right angles, slightly skewed, which would deflect that, that uh, elastic moment into spin into the atom. We, so we, we don't hit it head on, we hit it at right angles to deflect it. That way you don't cancel out the energy vector. Doing this, you are then theoretically able, we haven't been able to sustain this. Uh, we've gotten some interesting results and hurt a couple of people. But um, uh, you can pulse energy into this, phase related to that, and theoretically build up a large circulating current in these two coils from one to the other, which will go out many, many feet. It's a magnetic storage device. Uh, this Searle generator in England, I think, uh, has similar characteristics, even though he does it with high voltage. We're just talking here with normal uh, low current, um, oh, sorry, high current low voltage devices. Voltage does build up. Uh, the wires we're talking about using here are not thin wires, they're great thick wires because the current adds up. Here's what I mean. Normally, if you're running current through a wire, just any old wire coil, it goes through into the load and back into your source and the energy's been exchanged. If it's consuming 100 watts of power, uh, say 1,000 watts, like a bar heater in your home, it consumes 1,000 watts of power, which is 1,000 joules of energy every second. If you leave it on for an hour, you consume 3,600 joules of energy to run that electric bar heater with one element. If you could take that, that uh, 1,000 joules or, or watts each second, and instead of just letting it radiate out in heat, you could turn it into a dynamic circuit here. Remember, conversely, as you store the energy in one, one coil, it's helping to reduce the resistance of the other. It forms an artificial kind of um, very low resistance uh, tank circuit. If you could do that, then you could run your electric bar here, one uh, kilowatt of power into here for an hour, and you would have the equivalent of 3,600 kilowatts, 3.6 megawatts of power stored in this coil. Now, the cross-sectional area of the coils would have to match the equivalent voltage uh, so that the resistance doesn't cause a meltdown. That's theoretically. What we have been able to do has, has worked a fraction of a second, and then we can't get the whole thing to work. You might have to toss it away and build it again. I can't, I can't move it in the lab to another location. If you move it to a fresh location with a new one, it seems to work, but we seem to burn out. If you burn out in one spot, that spot, that room doesn't work there anymore as far as that coil is concerned. It's, it's a completely... I'm sure it could be something screwy in our wiring, or, but it, uh, at, at this moment it seems as though it's connected to something we have no idea what it's connected to. And it did some odd things. It bent light. It, the light in the room, when it, it worked for a fraction of a second, the light of the walls and everything was like it was painted on cellophane, and it, it seemed to just bend in toward it, like the room was stretched, but the room didn't stretch. It was the light. It was momentarily just focused at the coil, and then the coil didn't work anymore, and everything was normal. In fact, I, I felt quite... Um, nauseous when it hit. It was uh, just a passing thing, but then the coil was gone, or it didn't work anymore. Anyhow, notice this, a coil around this coil here. This was our first attempt, and this is, uh, you know, the, uh, the bumblings of uh, amateurs going at it. So, knowing this, I started uh, working on the Philadelphia experiment because I remembered that there were some coils or something there in the, the paper I'd read, and so I started collecting all the de documentation I could get on the Philadelphia experiment um, from a lot of sources, and one official source came to hand from 1972, I think, from the Naval Education and Training Support Can uh, Command of the United <laughs> States, uh, uh, it's a um, 1976 version of an earlier ship degaussing system, this, which is what was reported to have been used on the, um, the um, uh, ship in the Philadelphia experiment. It has a stock ordering number of 0502-LP-054-3250. Um, Naval Education Training Support Command to deal with degaussing of ships for magnetic mines. Now, before I got this document, I always thought that um, when you degaussed a ship so that magnetic mines wouldn't be attracted to it and explode, um, that um, what happened is that somehow or another they ran a magic field that was oscillating over the hull of the iron ship and scrambled its, uh, its uh, atoms so that it didn't have any magnetic uh, content to it. And so, you know, the magnetic mind wouldn't do it. But if you think about it, that's all wrong. If you've got a, 
a metal boat, an iron boat, a uh, magnetic mine's going to go for it anyway. Because as your boat moves through the water in any place in the world, it changes the Earth's magnetic field by its presence. It sucks in the lines. The lines bend into it. And these magnetic mines say, ah, oh, somebody's near and it's a big one, explode. This is the old days. Uh, mines are more sophisticated now. Anyway, so I, I ordered this paper when I found it was available. And I'm just drawing it because I can't show you the drawings here without a, a, an epidioscope. But here was a boat. And surprise, surprise, the way the degaussing coil work, coils was that a guy sat down the bottom of the boat with his headphones on and with dials. And they had mapped the entire planet so that they knew the there's three vectors in a magnetic field. They knew the declination, the, the bearing. They had all of these vectors uh, for every spot on the globe. And they knew if you were in that spot without anything magnetic, that the vector reading should be thusly so. So he would adjust these three coils, each in a different plane, to make his ship's signature magnetically look like it wasn't there. It took a 16 kilowatt generator to do that. That's not a lot. 16 kilowatts, that's eight double bar heaters. That's all he used to change the magnetic field for his entire ship. But what really amazed me was this. As bad as my drawing is, there was one set of coils that went this way, another set of coils that went um, through the ship, amidships like this, lined up in this plane. I'm doing it in a perspective view, but the, the coils were actually going through like that. Like this. Here's the boat. We've got coils going this way around the ship, got coils going this way around the ship, and the third axis somewhere, where we, and one going around this way. That was this one here. They covered every axis and overlap on every two. So I realized during wartime, World War II, resources were short. You couldn't get a budget to make an experiment like the Philadelphia experiment. What were they doing? Well, from Brown and various other people that I have been able to talk to directly on this subject, all they were trying to do was use some of Einstein's theory and make a dynamic magnetic field around that ship so that when they came close to um, shore-based radar, that as the radar pulse hit it, it would never come back. It would be caused to bend around this and not reflect. It would bend around this magnetic field that would be so powerful that to radar, this would not exist because the, it would not send it back. It would just bend it around and let it go right on like it wasn't there. Why? Remember the uh, smoke ring that went through the cloud? Bent it and went on through? Use the inverse of that, put this here and send something past it. This becomes the moving cloud. It bends over the field and keeps on going. Great idea. To get their budget, they had to take a ship that was already fitted out as closely as they needed if they could find such a thing. Surprise, surprise. A minesweeper, or sorry, a, a degaussing thing for the, 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 the boat hull like that had enough power on board. They only needed to modify some of the current uh, values uh, and uh, a couple of other things for frequency and resonance. And they had here a perfect test model for what we were talking about a while ago, where I had my coils going that way, coil going this way, and then they had a third coil, which we hadn't uh, realized at the time. So they built a great big one of these things that we've been playing with. And this great big thing was to do nothing more on the day they tested it, but to blink off the radar. But here's the bottom line. Radar is electromagnetic radiation, just one different frequency of it. The light that we see is a higher frequency. It worked. It worked too well. They started to stack the energy in that boat. It wasn't getting out. It was flipping from one coil circuit to the other, phase related. So it never escaped. On board the ship, the test vehicle, the Eldridge, the crew is um, noticing that it's getting very bright inside. And they notice that the water next to the boat is they're still chugging along in the middle of all the other observation craft. The water's traveling at the normal speed next to them, but it starts to get molasses and thicky like and sluggish out further away from the ship, way out there, till it appears like it's not moving at all. Why? They're in the center of the field. Their atoms were speeded up. Everything was uniformly accelerated in that field. Well, reasonably uniformly. The non-uniform part killed a few of them and stuck pieces of them in the hull, um, which 
leads me to believe that uh, what Bruce is saying about, you know, reality and, and anti-reality or mass antimatter is probably true. We have a parallel space that we, I mean, even Einstein suggested that too, uh, that we aren't aware of the other space because we can't test it without being in that uh, that mass uh, state. We could have another t uh, entire reality parallel to this one, uh, occupying the same space but at alternate phase, and all of our mass being in phase would never co uh, conflict, hypothetically. Anyway, whatever happened, they were operating faster. Now, on the ships out outside, looking at the Elridge, they're all scanning, and yeah, okay, what's that green cloud? This green cloud starts to form around the Elridge in the shape of it. And then the Elridge is not visible. The green cloud is, but the Elridge is not. It's covered in this cloud. And then the cloud's gone, and there's no Elridge. It's like the, 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 the eyewitness reports where it's just like a, a fluoro, how it blinks on. It blinked out, and there was nothing there, just a empty spot in the sea, gone. On board the Elridge now, their report says, I mean, if you can trust the sources we've got, um, okay, we were there, and uh, everyone else, we couldn't see too well, but we could see, the, you know, to navigate. Uh, they all seem to be standing still and not responding. So we chugged down to our, our port, you know, a couple hundred miles away, chugged into the port, into our berth, turned off the field, ran it down, and now we skipped to a guy that was on duty, on guard duty there, which by his timing was two minutes after the Elridge disappeared 200 miles away, says, they appeared right there at their berth. I saw them all run around like crazy, little bitty ants just running on their thing, and then uh, uh, they pointed and yelled and looked, and then this green cloud came, because that's what they came out of, and there was this green cloud came again, and then they were gone. Two minutes later. So the rumor market comes back out over the years, saying um, the Elridge teleported 200 miles. Well, that's the obvious conclusion at that point. But what had happened was, they, their energy density, because all this energy was pumped in, they were experiencing time a lot faster than we were. They moved through the water. Where their area was, they were imparting this inertia, and it was being amortized over this. It would be like you trying to move through the water now, normally, at uh, 3,000 miles an hour or something. You'd find it a brick wall. It would flatten you. Because of the, the field doing it, this movement was amortized out over a great volume of water, much like that toroid effect, I suspect. And so their passing did generate friction. It probably did heat the water in the area. Nobody was looking to test that, obviously. And they chugged along at their speed, which, if we could have seen it, would have been going like that, so fast that it blinked out and blinked back in. Ergo, in the UFO scene, if we do have a Dinkum report that says the UFO was there and it blinked out, I don't dismiss that now. I used to think it was hogwash, but I don't now, because of the Philadelphia experiment. And I, I must tell you, we haven't done much work on it for a couple of years because uh, it hurt. It really hurt us physically uh, when we uh, got zapped with whatever we produced. It's, uh, it's, I think we should know more about it before we play with it personally anyway. And I'm telling you this so those of you who got more um, time and resources, if you want to pursue that, you can. Uh, it certainly leads to a a novel way to propel a craft. I'll tell you what you will find. I missed that. I hope it was nice. If you can <clears throat> set up one of these coils in a craft or a series of these coils, like so, and generate a pulse in the magnetic field of the planet you're next to, you can create a bubble. And the beauty of this is you could put a Volkswagen <laughs> tiny Volkswagen car, you know, a 60 horsepower engine in here, generating the electric field and stoke your field up for 20 to 30 minutes. I mean, 60 horsepower, 60 horsepower, now we're looking at about, what, uh, 60 times 700 and some odd uh, watts, say 0.7, that'd be about, um, what, 4,200, um, is that right, 42,000, 4,200, I forget now, my mind's gone old. 700, and then it'd be, you know, so it'd be 7,000, then it'd be 42,000, 42,000 watts, 42 kilowatts in a 65 horsepower at 100% conversion. So it'd be 42,000 watts of power per second being pumped into this field. If multiply that by, say, 2,000 seconds, uh, 40 minutes or something like that. You could put in the equivalent of 2,000 60 horsepower engines into a field that is circulating in and around that craft. So you say, so what? Why does it move? If this field is in a magnetic field and it is moving in this manner, it will create in that field compression 
and decompression areas, just like with air. If we take a hot air balloon and put a torch down here and heat up the hot air balloon, eventually, from that little gas cylinder there, the hot air will define a high, uh, sorry, a, 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 a high energy density in here, so the average particle is moving like uh, very fast. And this will cause the balloon to seek what is technically called its specific gravitational level in the atmosphere. It will rise. Now, I had a physicist who was the head of theoretical physics at a particular institution, which will remain nameless for legal reasons, tell me there is no earthly way that you can support an X ton or an X so many kilogram craft over one spot for 10 minutes without consuming more fuel than you could put in a Saturn V booster. I said, yeah, but what about if we hooked up a big balloon to it and heated the air up with a lot less power than a Saturn V booster, wouldn't it lift it? That's different. That's different. But it's not. The bigotry closed his mind to this. If we can define a field, even though it's dynamic and moving, the atoms in here are moving too, by the way, but if we define it this way so that we have vectors away from the top but compressing in the bottom, we have, in essence, in vectors, we have a positive vector here, a, a, a crowding of energy, if you wish, and vectors going away from this point, we have, by definition, a thing that cannot sit still. It has always got to move toward where the top is pointing, always. And if you stack the energy in that field, the same as they did here, you can move. I am convinced, I'm absolutely positive in my own mind, that we have this craft, Earth-made anyway. Why? Because in about 1977, in a meeting in, in Brisbane at the Cooperu High School, I'd been lecturing like this all day. And I was tired, it was nighttime, and I was behind stage packing up to go home. And there were a few people there to talk about this, and that was before I'd written a book. And there were a thousand people there that day. And one of these thousand people was this little old guy, I mean, not an old guy, you know, middle-aged guy, but very fine, bony features. And he had this little plastic bag, and we had a lot of friends. So in fact, uh, the uh, Queensland uh, government had supplied uh, some uh, police protection that particular day, and we needed to, to usher two people out. There'd been death threats, and we thought, right, okay, this guy's a bit weird. He's hanging around behind stage. I was the only one back there, when I, and he was at the end of the line, and no one came back to help. And here's this guy with his bag, and his hand in the bag, and we thought, well, it's either a gun or a knife or whatever. I did anyway. And uh, so he kept moving to the back of the line, letting everybody through until he was the last one. And so he came over and he says, I've got something here for you. And he reached down and, you know, so I got ready to get shot, you know, and uh, out he pulls this dossier, a wad of papers, you know, just thicker than this. And he says, this is a dossier on you. Now, nowadays I could expect that. Before I'd even written a book, I was uh, fairly cautious about what I said up to that point because I didn't want to complicate my life any. On the top of the dossier was two SX-70 original color Polaroid photographs. They, were, they still had the backing on them and everything. Inside, mm, a work area, which I think was probably in a hot country. The men were in short-sleeved um, uh, overalls, a uh, very clean environment with corrugated metal running up about two stories. A standard thing like you'd see at a wool store or something like that with metal sides on it. Down inside this area, they gave me a, a wide shot of a craft. He didn't say it was a craft. He said, um, we thought it was time that you were brought up to date because what you're talking about as far as a plasma drive is old. You must know it's old. I said, oh yeah, sure. Mm. <laughs> and he says, let's, let's show you the magnetic one. And I said, what am I looking at? He says, let's don't play games. You know what you're looking at. Look at it. I said, well, can we go across the street? There's a photocopy there. You can keep your photos. You just photocopy. Let me have it. He said, surely you don't think you could do that. I said, all right, let me study it. So I'm th trying to figure out how am I going to tackle this guy because in amongst the dossier was stuff on me. I, I mean, only an intelligence agency could have known, and it was there. He, a collection of stuff, it was amazing. Things I didn't even know existed. Thank goodness. But anyway, I, I believe the guy came from somebody. I don't know who, what group. But looking into this, um, I'm just trying to figure out how uh, perspective-wise the roof seemed to go like this, out like that. It was a solid thing with the fluoros up here, like a big workshop. And this went way out of, out of sight. And there were some men, uh, men would be about that size in it. Uh, no, a little bit smaller. Okay, over here was a thing like um, this. Looked kind of like a pharaoh's um, 
Pharaoh's little headband type thing. I'll show you why in a second. Because around it were these great big flat coils. And uh, this is the other part of it here. It seemed to make a little archway there. For some reason or another, they connected the coil across an air gap. I think I understand, but I, I can't swear to it at this point. Actually, that might be why. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, they had a coil around that way. And they had all kinds of bits and pieces laying on the floor, including some sections of the coil. It was a coil that you could... Actually, there was a section missing out of here. It went in there. And then they had a thing up here, some wires and a looks like a, a pole here, and uh, like a workbench here with some standard reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and a normal clock, just for like a, a minute sweep clock. All these guys running under, and then a close-up of the end of that. He said, for my benefit, so I could see how the coils were in cross-section. And I could see little bits and pieces of stuff in here, and I could see how the, the wrapping went around here. And with that, my wife burst through the back door to the stage to see why I hadn't come out. And he grabbed the stuff like that and darted out the side door and was gone. None of our guys could catch him. We did chase him. Now, years later, of course, by a totally different route, we come to wrapping toroidal coils like this around coils that went that way and around that way. And finding out through uh, our other source in Europe that there was two pieces missing here. On the side, after they put this piece in here, there was a big flat coil here and one here, which were then, I think, as he, as he stated, bent over and wrapped over this, and it was for directional control, all right? Now, he said it was so important in the, in the, uh, in the manufacturing area of these things, they were polarized uh, like they were, they were DC currents running in them. It was so important that the pole this one be correct in respect to that, that they had a mark with great big paper labels when they installed them on the craft, because if you reversed them and fired up the field, it caused a horrific fire and great damage to everybody around. Maybe something like the Philadelphia experiment. I think I understand what they're talking about, pinching the field with these, uh, these side coils to make it defined to go this way or that way or, or whatever, in conjunction with this little work they've got here. Anyhow, I am certain somebody that looks human as I am on this planet has been assembling and using these things, not only from the photographs, but from talking to people who used to guard them. In fact, I'd say without qualification, very shortly we will see a videotape here in Sydney, I'd say almost immediately, which will exhibit something that was filmed here in this country of a UFO. Let's just say it looked like that exhibiting a peculiar effect that I had not really discussed at length publicly. My security fellow who was involved in this was telling me he was watching one tested in the north of Europe after World War II. It was sitting on the deck and it was an early test and the crew had gotten on board and it was daylight and the thing lifts up out of its cradle. This is about uh, 20 to 40 feet in diameter. The field effect on his went out 800 uh, feet in diameter, 400 in radius. He said the crew took it up off the berthing bay and very carefully moved it this way, slowly this way, as though they were testing things to be sure that it was working all right before they pulled the switch. So then they pulled the switch. And he said, as fast as I, I was standing there looking, he said, as fast as I could raise my eyes to follow it, it zipped up out of sight. And he said, behind it, it left, it dragged a rainbow um, gradation uh, a gradation in the air like uh, a Doppler shift in light it formed a rainbow that went behind it now that I can understand that I can understand relate to a magnetic field and to changes in the magnetic field as you move through it varying levels of electron potential and ionization of the air that makes sense there is a videotape in color in this country taken recently of a craft doing just that we're going to check it out I'm sure you'll get to see it eventually but that's the first time I've ever seen any uh, video evidence or even heard of it in the civilian sector of this kind of a craft. Most of you have probably seen one of these in some science shop. It's a little radiometer. It's a vacuum in there and there's a little needle supporting some uh, black and white tiles. One side is white, one is black. If you put this in your oven and turn the oven on, it will start to spin. If you hold it up next to a bright 
infrared light source or a match, it will start to spin. Now, I kind of messed up. It's my fault. I was going to set this on the top of one of the overhead scanners and let the light come up underneath it and spin this so you could see it spinning up there in the spin rate. However, take my word for it, you can put a torch, uh, a normal battery-operated torch on that, and it spins like crazy. Now, outside the vacuum, it doesn't spin as fast because there's a lot of air it has to drag against. This is purely light photons striking the surface, one side absorbing the other reflecting, and it causes it to be imbalanced, and it turns. What we're getting here is motion in the difference between the strike going that way and the strike bouncing off this way. The difference is what is moving this, and it's a minor difference. Moray, T. Henry Moray. His, his patents were never accepted by the U.S. Patent Office. He had working models, not one but three. He tried to patent, he submitted the things to, to the U.S. Patent Office. My father went after those patents, or the applications. They keep a folder on these things, you know. He was apologized to profusely by the clerk on duty, saying, well, Mr. Dale, I'm very sorry. The folder's there, but they're empty. I don't know what's happened to the originals, and we don't have any copies. We got every scrap of information from that family and from people that knew him and engineers that had made the valve for him. We got every scrap we could get, Ed and I, on, on, on Moray's uh, Moray valve and how he got energy out of the atmosphere with this little wire he had about 85 feet long and, and these little three boxes. He was getting five to 10 kilowatts out of little boxes about that big, three of them on a tabletop. And he, he wasn't secret about it. Heck, he opened up the top, he invited the leading physicists, their names are there, their depositions sworn by notary publics, by sheriffs, by judges, everybody. And he said, look, here, this is a coil, take it, feel it. Physicists said, yeah, well, that's a coil, they went through the whole thing. The only thing he wouldn't let them see was a box about that size that he slipped in his pocket. He said, this is the, the tracking auto-tuner unit, which is how I get the energy out of the, uh, uh, the sea of energy in the universe. Now, before you think Moray is a crank, or even potentially so, understand that the modern transistor and all variations of it you have came from a patent that he developed with the guys at Bell Laboratories of the transistor. The transistor was invented by Moray, the first semiconductor device by Moray. He owned his own business. He was a PhD by normal standards. The guy was not a lunatic. One of the reports about Moray's device said that when it was running and generating the electricity to run the light globes, said that he could take it anywhere. He could even do it in an airplane. But he'd say, look, take me anywhere you want. Blindfold me, stick all the gear in the car, drive me to a spot, and I'll make it work. And then you can take it apart and look at it. And they did this. They took him to one place, and he got out, and he messed around the dirt at once. He said, yeah, okay, that's the spot. Choo, choo, choo. Drives a great, long, nine or 10-foot tall copper ground spike in the ground, takes that over and hooks it in the bottom of this, puts a rubber mat out, puts it all on it. Uh, sets up an antenna and just two wires, and uh, two poles and a wire across it with an insulator and the lead coming down into the box. Takes out his little tuner thing, sticks it in, kind of stokes it. Sometimes taking about five minutes for it to just catch just right. And it fires 10,000 watts of incandescent lights that start to come to action. They take it and they'd stick their hand down and carefully mm -hmm. stand on the rubber mat so they didn't get shot because there was high voltage. And they would feel inside and it was running cool. 10,000 watts of power is exchanging over here and this thing is running cool. He could go over and unplug the antenna, take it out of the box like this, and the lights would go, uh, like that, plug the antenna back in, back up it would go. He said, you know, it's funny, the more power you draw, if I put some more globes on there, the more power I can draw. The system will just keep right on supply. It's the energy of the universe, I guess he'd say. It comes in waves like the seashore waves, irregular, not like normal electromagnetic radiation. He was a fan of Nikola Tesla's. When he was 19 years old, he made his first Moray device work, quite by accident. Uh, copying a patent that Tesla had, had done at the turn of the century, which is available, a simple patent, a very simple patent, which shows a wire up over his laboratory, it's where it was, but anyway, it shows a wire on the patent application, the patent uh, document. Here's uh, this wire up here, comes down, Here's uh, the level of the building. It comes in like this. Here's a um, capacitor, capacitor like that. Um, across here was a um, resistive load, and this is ground. And up here, Tesla, true to exactly as you see here, put a 
metal plate up here. It was a highly polished metal plate with no oxide on it. It was early semiconductor days. And he let the sun shine on it. And it would charge up this capacitor and run his resistive load. It took two days. It wasn't exactly practical, but it was a step. So young Maury looked at this and he says, oh, hmm, you know, antenna must be building up a charge. What is it? For those of you, any of you guys uh, ham radio operators here? Okay, did you ever get the instruction to always strap your high voltage capacitors so that they don't build up a charge when they're unused? Yeah. You know why? Why do they build up a charge when you don't use them? What pumps the energy uphill to make them store that? No, voltage? They do that because it indicates they've already got the charge. <clears throat> Did you know that you can leave them in a room unattended even if you discharge them and they will build up a charge? You can, but it's, it doesn't do it all the time. It's because the air, the air pockets in the room have got to move right to let charges build up over the, 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 uh, the poles of it. Now, Moray took this, he hooked up a coil to it, a resistive load, and he noticed that he could hear clicks in it coming down the antenna. I'm paraphrasing and cutting out a lot of it, but anyway. He said there's power here. He succeeded at 19 in making a thing that was a transistor radio that played loud enough that he didn't need earphones. It wasn't a crystal set, it was a radio. Photographs of it, he kept it. The one thing that was the magic bit for it was something he called the Swedish stone, a white stone that he had gotten in Sweden. It had been in a rail car, which was an ore carrier for ores being mined in Sweden. We went and we analyzed everything that we could find about Sweden during that period of time and what they were mining and where they might have shipped it and what they might have had in the ore cars. We also read through a lot of his scribbles and scrawls that were very difficult to read because they were bad photocopies. Even in the original, they weren't too brilliant. Trying to find what chemical semiconductors he used to get this magic energy out of the system. We came up with a note of his, partially uh, obscured, that he used triboluminescent zinc. Triboluminescent zinc, triboluminism, comes from the emission, it's the emission of electromagnetic waves when you stress a crystal. It, it, if a crystal uh, releases a blue flash because you've stretched it like that or compressed it, uh, this light and also electrons is a piezoelectric uh, release of uh, energy. But in this case, he was looking at zinc because it has a a, um, a frequency bandwidth in the infrared. It responds to infrared radiation bilaterally, uh, electricity in, radiation and electricity out. But zinc sulfide, it's zinc in the sulfide form is a triboluminescent form of zinc. A simple form of that is if you have an electric uh, gas starter, one of these little things that you click like that, doesn't have any batteries, you just click it and you hear a clicking sound and an arc comes out and starts your gas fire or whatever. That's a, a, a crystal that you've thumped, and it makes electricity from being thumped at the, the right uh, frequency, and it, um, it uh, causes a hot enough arc to discharge the gas. That's a form of uh, piezoelectric uh, electric generation. Other fellows we studied, a guy named Perigo. We have some of the documents on this fellow. Perigo generated a uh, device which wasn't anywhere near as sophisticated as Moray's device. He um, had it in a kind of a uh, garage type affair, and he was lighting up light globes. His box was only about this big, and he had um, an antenna from the photo or the drawings anyway. Looked like there were two um, embroidery hoops with wires stretched across them like this, and with some leads coming off of these down into this box here, and a little electric motor and a light that's running off of all this stuff. About that big, the antenna. He wasn't drawing as much power as, as uh, Moray was, but he was certainly drawing significant amounts. He noticed, and it was reported in the newspapers at the time, which we picked up, that if you stood close to it, it worked better, made more power. If you shut the room up and were still over here out of the way, after it had been running a few minutes, it would start to die down. If you opened the window, it would run much better. If you cause a draft to blow, in other words. Thermal properties. Moray, his device runs cool while 10 kilowatts is going through it. Couldn't understand it. Moray again, some of the people that he invited into his home to listen to his radio form of the, of the Moray valve, 
he said to them, half of the group, you go out in the front of my house into the snow tonight, walk on out there and talk about whatever you want to, and I will tell you what you said. Moray stays in the house with his device, tunes it with the headphones on, has part of them staying in there with him to see that he's not messing about, and he, he listened to what they were saying. Then he says to one of the guys that's in the house, still come sit, you put the headphones on, listen to what they're saying. Well, I'll be, he could hear it. So Maury says to him, I'm just gonna go tell him to come in now and you can testify to what just happened. Don't turn the dials. So he goes out, what does the guy do? Turns the dials. He wanted to know what else happened in the Maury system. He turns the dials and he hears a guy's voice out there in the distance. All aboard, ding, 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 shh, shh. train leaving a train depot. There's no train depots in the neighborhood. He doesn't say anything. They leave, and he goes and tries to find out if there's a train depot anywhere in the neighborhood. Five miles away is the closest one it could have been. How did he receive, not an electromagnetic wave, but an acoustic vibration from not just the guy, but the whole scene? How did he get it? There were other muffled sounds involved, which may or may not have been at the train station. We suspect, if that's where they were, that by tuning it, what he had done, because of the nature of what I'm, I'm getting to, is it all along a circle out here in a very narrow band, he was getting any acoustic or any sound wave modification coming in that area was modulating the field that was coming in the antenna to supply power to them. Now, Maury never made a secret of it. He said, I've got a radio. He said, I could hear Admiral Byrd down at the South Pole when he was transmitting and no one else could hear it. I could hear it. How could he do this? We figured that out. If you cool, your receiving gear, your antenna, and you get it down so that you've got low thermal noise in the system, you can make a high gain amplifier that'll pick up lots of stuff. Superconductors. This is a few years before we figured this out that he's doing it. He didn't know why it's working, but it is working. His antenna was cool. How do you cool an antenna when you've got 10 kilowatts zipping down it? It puzzled us for a long time. The answer is this. If we wanted to cool this room down with an air conditioner, it'd probably take about a, with all these bodies in here, each is 100 watts, probably take about a 10 horsepower engine, and it'd take it probably 30 minutes to an hour to make it uncomfortable. If we could really put the herbs to the system, we could freeze this all in a couple of, well, maybe half a day, something like that. The amount of energy that it would take to freeze us is the energy that was available in here in the form of heat. A lot of energy. Take a 10 horsepower motor and run it for six, seven, eight hours. That's a lot of, a lot of energy. If you can convert that energy, that thermal molecular vibration into electricity, into a coherent form, then you can run devices. The devices will heat up release it back as chaos, as, as heat back into the room. You will take heat from the room, use it in one form, and put it back. Now, this is not magic. This is not breaking second law of thermodynamics. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is only redistributed as far as we understand at this point in time. Energy is never created nor destroyed. If you use an electric uh, current, part of the energy of the electric current is imparted as motion or electronics or whatever you're doing with the load device, and the rest is in the system. You exchange energy at one density for energy at another density. You have to have an exchange. If it is done harmonically in phase, wonderful things can happen. You can build a laser. How does a laser work? It works on a multitude of frequencies. A laser takes incoherent light, random light. It takes a percentage of that, which it eventually allows to bounce along its long axis until there are enough of them in a photon cascade that it punches through a half silver mirror, uh, mirror at the end, and you have suddenly a coherent in-phase beam of light where every one of them is parallel like that. Fairly well anyway. There's a slight divergence at about um, 100,000 kilometers. That's a laser. We have taken in our lasing gas or our lasing crystal, whatever they're using, we've taken sometimes a form of a light tube wrapped around it like that and we have pulsed it, bang. And your, your laser, as a general rule, does not fire continuously. There's microsecond gaps between bursts. While it builds up, all those that are going the same direction and punch out the end. It only gets part of the energy coming in, you know, 12, 15, 30 percent efficiencies. It doesn't get, take all the energy that is, is supplied to it and make a laser out, only portions of it. Because it takes incoherent, random motion and converts it by a crystal 
or a charged gas matrix into coherent light beam. It has converted it from one frequency of light to another. Now, can it convert it to electricity in your kitchen, a microwave? Do an interesting experiment, but only do it once. Take one of the chocolate eclairs you can get down at the store, you know, with the little gold wrappers on it, uh, ones that are usually too hard to break your teeth unless you warm them up a bit, and throw it into the microwave and push the button for all. 15 seconds, maybe not that much, and it will burst into flame. Not the chocolate, but the paper wrapping on it. The paper is plastic with a metal foil and then your candy. The microwave is coming in the form of an electromagnetic radiation in the gigahertz range, microwave. That goes down, strikes your capacity or your, your, your piece of metal paper, and is converted in that process to electricity. You can put frozen bread crumbs on a, on a plate with a gold metal rim around it, and it looks like Star Trek in there. The little bre bread crumbs teleport into non-existence with a brilliant blue flash. Electric charges. My wife doesn't appreciate that. I must tell you, it takes the gold with it. But... <laughs> what I am drawing your attention to is this. Properly done, that microwave heats things which have water, it heats them. It turns the microwave electromagnetic radiation into heat. By a, an addition of a piece of foil in there, I can turn that electromagnetic radiation into electricity instead of heat. Now can I turn the heat, go backwards, can I turn the heat into microwave or can I turn the heat into electricity? Heat, as we normally know it, is an electromagnetic radiation in the microwave region anyway. It's not a single frequency, it's a range of frequencies. A lot of the documentation of the sources you want to read are in the uh, index, in the, the rear end word index and name index in the new version of Cosmic Conspiracy. Look for these names uh, and you'll find them all on the same page or two. Uh, Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R, the Meyer hydrogen cell. Uh, look up uh, Perigo, look up uh, Meyer, M-E-I-R, uh, -E -E I think it is Meyer, I'm just trying to find it here. Anyway, you find any of those, they'll be on the same page and then start tracing references on that. The Meyer hydrogen or Meyer hydrogen cell is the closest one I've seen other than the Mori device, what I'm going to show you here. This is a bell curve, statistics. There's the median line. In randomness, if there is truly such a thing, um, things do this some of the time, sometimes they do that. This is a distribution showing where most events in some occurrence happen in here. In here, these events happen in that manner, in that description. Out at the extremities, we have extreme events. Now, what am I saying? If this were a curve of a bouncing ball on your computer screen, a computer game with a random movement to the ball, occasionally it will hit the top thing going that way. Occasionally hit the bottom thing going this way. Now, if this were a plot of the times it goes that way versus that way, then our distribution curve would look like that randomly. And the majority of its bounces would either be in this vector or that, that one or that, occasionally out here to the side, but mainly in this median zone. If we do this in molecules and try to look at it not just as a graph, but what is happening, they're a group of molecules in a solid. Um, here's you watching all this. Here's a z-axis, here's an x-axis, and a y. That's a 3D cube. Along this axis, particles that are moving towards you, vibrating towards you in a vibrating lump of anything, the air, iron, whatever, the things that are moving towards you sometime, and the, the molecules towards you are off to the side or away, will have a distribution vector like that. Those that are moving at right angles to you will have a distribution vector in this plane like that. Where's the other vector? That's rotated around the central vector, okay. Now, if you connect these things like this, saying reference to whatever viewpoint you want, you have, instead of a bell curve, you have a bell. A, a surface is defined by this. A percentage of the time major percentage of the time, these things are balancing where you've got as many of them coming towards you in a second as you've got going away from you. So the net movement of your body by this piece of mass you're holding is zero. In the thermodynamic equations for current flow, electron flow in a wire, 
they called this factor, this uh, thermal noise factor, zero because statistically it nets to zero. Occasionally you get white noise, a lot of the time on electric circuits or radio circuits, this noise is caused by the occasional net not zero movement of electrons and they get a little mobility and they give a voltage spike, a very small one. This generates white noise, a nuisance. But what it is really is telling you that if you could sample the vibrations of any, any mass at the right frequency, statistically, you would get a number of them going in your direction. And when you got them going in your direction, if you were to rectify it or make a diode that would trap that voltage variation into your system and not let it go back, two things would happen. You'd get some energy from that in the form of electricity. I'll explain that. And secondly, you would start to polarize that mass. The molecules in it would now start to vibrate to fill the hole, the inertial hole that you left by stealing the energy from it. It's mechanically vibrating. You come in here and say uh, mm, 137,000 millionth of a second, and you say, are you there? If any of you molecules are vibrating, here's one of my electrons. Hit me if you can. Ah, you got me. I move back now toward my collecting center post. I've got a higher effective uh, electric field and voltage because of this added motion to my moving charge carrier. This raises a voltage uh, spike on my center electrode, which goes to a diode and out to my system. I've crafted it. It can't go back. Now, this guy moves back this way and says, hey, hey, I just gave you a mechanical energy. Where is it? Can't get it from me because I just let it go to these guys. So it has an inertial hole. So the more energy you draw on this way and convert it to electricity, the more energy you can draw because the system starts to polarize toward that, that center electrode. That's why Moray said the more he drew, the more he could draw. How do you convert the mechanical motion to electricity? The way we're going to do it, simply, is we're going to have a, a, a tube like this, a wire down the well, a, a, another smaller tube down the center. We're going to coat the inside of this at this point with a, a mixture of zinc sulfide and a white powder. We're going to put a, a, a heat sink here. We're going to put a high voltage charge here. Um, uh, around 40 kV. And I'm just trying to remember, I think it's plus. It'll probably shoot me, I think it's plus on this. And we're going to uh, pull a partial vacuum on this. And our objective is this. We're going to have thermal exciting, you know, thermally excited moving mobile electrons and ions and atoms over on this mass here. Conductive outside copper tube, semiconductive zinc sulfide releasing these mechanically motivated moving uh, ions or electrons. And we're going to set up resonance at the wavelength in between there. So that, and this gets into gigahertz microwave uh, and infrared regions too, and varies with the system you've got. So that when we reference this to our load device and eventually to ground, we put in here a diode, a one-way gate, a high voltage diode. The idea being we make the heat think it's going to a cold place, so the energy will still obey the thermodynamic uh, equations. The heat will flow from the concentration to the less concentration. The heat will go from here, and as energy, it will say, there's an energy hole here, because every time I hit an electron, it doesn't give it back. It goes away. Why? Because it goes in here through a one-way gate over here it can't get back into, and all the guys say, ah, oh, we lost somewhere. They flow into the hole. I must make that point. It's a cascade effect. Now, when that happens, when that happens, the temperature of all of this changes. You've lowered the energy density on all the mass. You've just stolen some of its thermal agitation. It's now, it's now characteristic distribution curve changes. So you have to use what's called a heterodyning or a tracking circuit to see what the maximum efficient draw frequency on this is. It will change. If you grab it with your hand, it'll be a higher frequency. If you let it cool off, a lower one, we think anyway at this point. In this um, electric spacecraft journal, I'm going to draw this so you can see it. The author or the editor, uh, Charles uh, Yost, found some documents from 1969, I think, October 26, 1969, in Design News, um, where they're talking about an unusual high voltage effect that they noticed in relation to a heat device. 
And uh, I'd seen the photographs of this in, a, in an ad in a magazine back in that time and thought, wow, that's incredible because it's real. And this is the effect that he was showing. Here's a piece of uh, paper. It was uh, like uh, tissue paper, like uh, Kleenex. Over here is a butane gas torch with a flame. Uh, and this is the front here. This flame is splattering out onto this tissue paper and it's not burning. It doesn't even get brown. Back here, what you don't see, but you do see in the, in the report that went with it, is a rod which comes down and does this. And it sprays on the back of the paper 40 kV electrons. And that's not the only test he did. The electrons hit here. The charged ions of this came down. The repulsion was so fast and so great that it would not even scorch or slightly warm the tissue paper. The electrons moved the heat. There is part of the thermodynamic equations for electricity that has the thermal velocity for the electron versus the electric velocity. When you get the electric velocity up high enough to match the thermal velocity in 10 to the fifth meters per second, whatever it is, you start to see interesting effects like this. The high voltage is essential in any of these converters we're talking about. They did another thing. They said, right, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's take a red hot pipe. So they take a red hot pipe. This is a metal tube. Um, this is the torch that we just saw with the flame going inside the tube like that. This tube is now red hot in a zone about right here. They now take two rods. And this one is uh, reference to this one as such. Now, they didn't fire this up until after they got the tube hot. Then they fired this up, and the tube cooled off within 30 seconds to a black, cool tube there, and the rest around it was, was hot. Here was hot, and that was hot, but that was cool. A long time ago, like a generation, maybe two, half a generation, half, there was something called the lapelier effect, which Japan is using quite happily now then in some of their video cameras as a heat exchanging device, which works magically. They found a long time ago, Lapelier did, the Frenchman, that if you have two dissimilar metals, let's call this uh, bismuth and copper, this will be copper here, two dissimilar metals, this is bismuth, that's bismuth, little bars, and they just are uh, pressed or soldered together, but let's say heated together, fused together, the copper and the bismuth. If we put a negative charge there and a positive charge here and run a current through, this junction right here will get so hot that it would boil a drop of water. This junction over here would get so cold that it would freeze a drop of water. If you reverse the current and go negative to positive, this now boils and this freezes. They, until 10 years ago, they, being the scientific community, were not really in agreement on what causes that. It's a nice effect, but they didn't understand it. Heat is being pumped, exchanged by the electrons going through here at a very low current. These things have voltages less than a volt. In fact, less than uh, even a third of a volt. Our nuclear power stations on board our satellites, the satellite ones, they have a, a nuclear controlled reaction going on between a, a, a fission decay system. And they have two plates, I think it's of iridium oxide, we'll just call them IO. And they are spaced four ten thousandths of an inch uh, apart. This one over here is heated to 2,000 degrees centigrade. This one over here is kept at 1,000 degrees centigrade by heat um, uh, exchange devices or vanes vented to, uh, to the space outside the craft. This produces an efficiency of 
In other words, 88% of the energy of the nuclear reaction is dissipated in heat by the veins to the external side of the craft. 12% gets converted to electricity during the spacecraft system. Since you've got a lot of energy in the nuclear reaction for years and years, that's okay. But 15% is the best anybody's been able to get with a thermionic or a thermoelectric converter. Using the high voltage technique, which moves flames and heat that rapidly, that tuned to the bell curve will allow us to sample the uh, net uh, mechanical motion of the ions and turn it into electricity. This is why Moray probably said, it's not like electromagnetic radiation. You don't lock right onto it, it wanders a bit. And your bell curve distribution will wander. We haven't made ours work yet. We have just crawled up out of the mud to this high again. And if any of you out there on this tape, if any of you do make yours work before we do, do not patent it. Do not patent it. It'll be the, the worst mistake you'll ever make. You do not own this. None of us do. If you patent it, it will go into oblivion again, and so will you, either by bribe or by death. We have to share this. In 22 countries, those of us who are trying to crack this code are working day and night to do this. Why? Because we are going to give it to you. I'm not selling shares in this. I'm not selling books with this. I'm telling you, this is where we are. This is how far we've struggled. We don't have a working model yet. I have no zero point energy rotation. I have no magic. I'm not going to tell you until I've got a working model. I'm not going to tell you that will work. I, I think it will work. I tell you why I think it worked from proven, accepted scientific facts that do work. I encourage you to do this, but whatever you do in most of the treaty nations of the patent agreements across the Western world, do this. Publish it. Publish it and put it out rapidly. It then becomes public domain and no one can own it. If you patent or try to patent a device built on this concept or any other thing that might be considered detrimental to the economy or an, um, a strategic advantage to the country or a military secret, the patenting solicitors and the patent office are obliged by law to put this before the defense scrutineer in this country and the equivalent in the other Western countries. They must then analyze your patent and say, Look, the guy is trying to patent something we already have, private or, or classified patent. Please inform him to cease and desist. He's now covered under National Secrets Act until uh, further notice, which means if you violate it, you go to jail or get a fine. Secondly, they can say at their option, gee, that's an incredible device. Great stuff. You're under National Secrets Act now, then we'll figure out what to do with it. Don't talk to your neighbor, your friends, anybody else. It has to be covered under National Secrets Act. That means that you stop work, just like J. Frank King did for six years on his plasma ring polyphase system, which had bugs. It wasn't a perfect system of flying saucer, but six years he waited for the American government to finally do it. J. Frank King was the president of his own company. He was a well-respected man. So don't patent it. Publish and save the technology. We haven't got time for anybody to be a new Ford motor car or, or baron of some technology or the Sarich engine. We haven't got time. Us out here, we need this technology. The one single factor that any group, no matter whether it's Alien or Rockefeller or whatever you want to say, the one single factor they're most afraid of is for you to be energy independent of the system. Because you won't have to pay your SEC. You won't have to pay a lot of your taxes you pay because you will be able to produce your own energy, make your own devices, cool your own house, drive your own car, even make the components out of local energy available in heat around your house. You'll be able to cool your house with an air conditioner that supplies the power from that cooling to run your water heater. You won't buy petrol anymore, and this collapses the economy. There are some very sound reasons for you not to have it, in their opinion. Our whole cultural uh, structure could collapse overnight, because if everyone could do it and make it with a $1.95 worth of things from Dick Smith or something, we'd be in trouble. It's not quite that simple, I, I agree, but... <laughs> do you see how powerful you could be with any device, whether it be this concept or what, with any device that could really make energy a lot cheaper. I hope we succeed. I hope you guys out there, whoever you are, succeed. And I hope you take my advice, because Maury didn't figure it out until it was too late. And virtually his dying words were, why didn't they help me? Why didn't they? His last writings on the subject were, I think it has something to do with Brownian motion and interface between conductors and semiconductors and molecular motion. His last words. And here we are. We're right on the edge of it. I promise you, if you're a physicist, you've got to know what I'm talking about. We're talking not concept problems, not theory problems. 
We're talking engineering, simply engineering problems to get this to work at a microwave uh, frequency. It may work at lower frequencies, I don't know. Okay, next. I do this to you. <laughs> um, well, as I just said, that is it for the day. Um, we've run about three quarters an hour over time, and I'm sure Stan could have been here for hours more. Uh, thank you for coming. Good luck.